I am delighted to be here with your president and the faculty and the students. It is such a mark, and to John, to Dr. Nunez, the, let me start by quoting poetry. It was William Carlos Williams who said, it's difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men die miserably every day because of a lack of what is found there. It was our beloved and now late Maya Angelou who spoke to the world, to this country and the world, at the installation of another president of our country. And she said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands, mold it into the image of your most public self, sculpt it into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, Good morning. Good morning, Valparaiso. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Give her a hand for poetry. For poetry. For poetry. <laughs> Every person has a story. And now I'm thinking back to Birmingham 50 years ago when I was sitting in the back of the church not wanting to be there. If you can hear me all the way in the back rows, raise your hands, let me see you. This is a magnificent structure, edifice mark. The challenge I'm face facing right now as a math teacher is that I want to see the faces of the people in the back. Raise your hands again in the back of the room, okay? If I start losing you, raise your hands to let me know I need to project more, got it? And I'm not going to talk that long, but I am delighted to be here. I'm honored with your president, with faculty, and with others. It is a special day. And as we were singing, lift every voice and sing what we call the Negro National Anthem, what I learned as a child in Birmingham. And then as you were singing, his eye was on the sparrow. I couldn't help but think back to my own experiences in church. And I thought about how fortunate you are as students to be at a university where you can sit in a wonderful, wonderful space like this and have the chance to think about your values. Because it will be your dreams and your values that will shape who you are not only today but in the future as young students, as a university, as a society. I was sitting in the back of church at Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. We seem to be always in church in Birmingham. And my parents had insisted that I go and listen to this visiting pastor. And they placated me, students, with the two things I enjoyed most, mathematics and food. <laughs> you see, I was a fat little kid. In the South, we like those cheeks, all right? And I'm doing my algebra, I'm 12, and I'm eating M&Ms, the good kind, with the peanuts. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right? And I'm trying to listen, but I really don't want to. But at one point, the minister says, and if the children participate in this peaceful march, all of America, will understand that even our babies know the difference between right and wrong. And they'll be able to go to even stronger schools. And I looked up because I was always bothered 
that my friends and I were given what we called hand-me-down books. After the white children had used them for years, people would put this brown paper bag around the covers, and then they would give them to the Negro schools. And I'll never forget in the second grade when they said, don't peel the paper back off of the cover. And I was bored in class, and I kept peeling just a little back, hoping the teacher wouldn't see that I'd done it. And before I knew it, I had peeled back enough to see the name of the white school. And I went up to the teacher and I said, why would they give us their throwaway hand-me-down books? And she was obviously embarrassed, but the first thing she said was, I told you not to take that paper off that book. <laughs> but then she said something to me that has stood the test of time. She said, son, you don't have time to be a victim. She said, the book may be second rate, but you are a child of God, and you are as good as anyone else, and you can be whatever you decide to be if you decide to do it. Now, all of that came to me from my second grade experience when I'm sitting in the back of church, and I hear him say, we want the students to march to say, it's not fair that children are given less than others, that our children are given less than others. It's not fair that they can't drink out of a water fountain. It's not fair that they can't walk through the front door. It's not fair that they can buy a hamburger standing up, but they're not good enough to sit down. And I'll never forget thinking it was the first time I had ever believed in the possibility that tomorrow could be different from today. I had thought that always I would have to go through the back door, that always I would get the secondhand books, that regardless of what my parents said about being a child of God, that the society would see me as second class. And there was this man, and I said, who is that guy? And of course his name was Dr. Martin Luther King. And my eyes were opened. For the first time, I was able to face the challenge of change, that the world could be different, and that I would have to be the change. And there and here, I can tell you, here is my message today, young people, that the way you think about yourselves, the language that you use in interacting with others, the values that you hold, whatever it is that is so important to you, will be so important, you will become like those things. And if you believe that the world can be better, and if you understand the role you can play in making the world better, whether you're sitting right here where I can see your face or all the way in the back, wave your hands again, let me see you, wave your hands. I'm talking to you especially, all right? That you have the opportunity right now to face this challenge of change and to say, I will be the change that I will be the change. You know, I come from a campus that has students from over 100 countries. And amazingly, we talk about comparative religion. We talk about our values, the things we have in common. And we talk about how different the world is today from 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we would not have seen the different races and ethnic groups and religions sitting in one setting. We have come to appreciate the idea that people can have different backgrounds and we must learn to respect them. That as human beings, we need to learn to understand both cultural differences and what we have in common as human beings. That we do indeed all bleed. That we do indeed all cry that we do indeed aspire for a higher order of things in our lives. You're so blessed 
here at Valparaiso, to be in an environment that talks about the light and the light within you, to be in an environment that talks about the significance, in, in, whether in words or in actions, the significance of having one's faith, of being driven by something larger than oneself. You know, when I tell you that the world is different, you might be surprised to know just how small the number of college-educated Americans we had in the 60s. People tend to think, well, the world has changed a little. Well, the percent of Americans with a college education in the 60s, when I went to jail with Dr. King, I spent a week in jail, by the way. I did go. I did say to my parents, I want to go and participate. And when we got home that night, I should tell you, my parents said, absolutely not. You cannot go. And I was very angry, students. And I said to my mother and father, you guys are hypocrites. Now, at that time, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. You did not do that. And my father said, son, go to your room. I knew I was in trouble. And the next morning, I talk about this in my new book on holding fast to dreams. And the next morning, they came in. And for the first time in my life, I could tell that my parents had been crying. And they said they had not slept all night. They had prayed all night, prayed for the wisdom to know what to do. Because they had sent me, they had, they had taken me to church. They heard this minister say he wanted the children to participate in this march. But I was their only child, and he was asking them to let me go and be among the dogs and the fire hoses and to be taken to jail. And they came in that morning and said, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We didn't trust the people who would be over you in jail. We are concerned about your safety, but we're going to put you in God's hands. And if you want to go, you can go. I've thought about their decision many times. My son is now grown. And I've often asked myself the question, would I have been willing to let my son go? It is a hard question, but it was their faith that allowed them to let me go. Now, this is the part that I only in recent years began telling students. People said, oh, you must have been a really brave kid. I was anything but brave. The only thing I had ever attacked in life was a math problem. <laughs> if a fight began, I was going the other way. Did you get that? I was not fighting anybody other than a math problem. Goosebumps with math, other than that, that was it. But I knew I wanted a better education. And the message, the lesson is this, that people who do things that seem courageous aren't just somehow innately courageous. They just seem to seem to build the strength to do what they have to do because it brings about some change that they want to see. I was so afraid. And when we walked and we were taught to sing songs, to sing songs as we were marching through the dogs, the dogs, the lines of dogs and fire hoses. And the police had been taught, you'll appreciate this, to do things to upset us so that we would be violent when it was supposed to be a non-violent march. Now, what is the one thing you can say to a child that will upset that child of any race? Who is the one person you must not talk about if you don't want to upset that child? That child's mama, right? So the police were whispering to us very, very ugly things about our mothers. And the way they taught us, the civil rights leaders taught the children to withstand, not to hear it, was to sing songs. So I'm, you know, it wasn't that we had voices like Monique. We could just, just, we, you know, so it wasn't like they sounded good, but all these hundreds of children, ain't going to let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. Keep on a walking, keep on a talking, marching on to freedom land. If you could imagine hundreds of children just marching with the music, elevating us, giving us the strength. 
And I get up to, to City Hall to the steps and the commissioner, the police commissioner, God, he looks so scary to me. And he looks down at me and he says, what do you want, little nigra? And I'm nervous and I said, sir, sir, we want to kneel and pray for the freedom to go to better schools. And he's so angry, he just spits in my face. And he picks me up and they throw me into the police wagon. And we're off to jail. And the significance of all of it was this. Yes, it was a terrible week in jail, but it empowered us young people. Whether we were 12 or 9 or 15, it empowered us to understand that every human being has the right and should have the opportunity to speak up when he or she sees injustice. Give the children of Birmingham a round of applause for marching and saying we wanted a better way. And I'll never forget when we got back to school, finally the school board actually threw us out of school. We were expelled from school. Now I was this fat little nerdy math major. I was a math kid. I was an A student. And all of a sudden I couldn't go to school. They, and they wanted to embarrass us. And so the principal who did not want to put us out of school decided to do, he was so bothered that he was being forced to throw these kids out, to expel them and until the courts made a decision. And he did something that was powerful. He called the entire school together. He didn't let us go out in disgrace. He called the school together and he had a, an assembly that resembled the honor society induction. And he talked to some of us about Thoreau's civil disobedience. And if you can imagine when he called every child's name to the, to the stage and he talked about justice and courage. He was talking about the children, but he was also talking about himself, Mark, as a principal going against the school board, not by the letter, but by the spirit, because they wanted us to feel like we were nothing. And he was saying, don't you allow anybody else to define who you are. There's the message. And when we got up there, he said, I'll never forget. Look into the faces of these children. They reflect the best of us. And the student body gave us a standing ovation. And we all cried because we were so ambivalent. We didn't know what it meant. And amazingly, the courts put us back in school, and we were doing better. And then in September, I saw the picture you have in your program. There are four little girls. If you get a chance, look at those pictures of the four little girls. They were my friends, family friends. One was in my class. And if you get a chance, look at Spike Lee's movie, his documentary, Four Little Girls. I'm featured in that, talking about the experience. And here is the point. That Friday in September when everybody in Birmingham, we blacks thought things were getting better for the first time. We were talking about being able to go into a store and sit down or to get a sandwich and be able to eat it right there. For the first time, they were talking about having the first black police officer, the first black fireman. We had nothing like that before that. And my little friends had been in church in Sunday school. They were dressed in white. They were all 14 years old. The niece was younger, eight. And they were going to be ushers in the church. And they were down in the bathroom in the basement, primping and laughing. How could they have known that some racist had placed a bomb under the commode in the bathroom? And I'm sitting in my sister church, a church that's 6th Avenue Baptist and 16th Street, two churches. And all of a sudden, our pastor says, 16th Street Baptist Church has been bombed. And if you can imagine sisters in one church and another, parents in one church and children in the other, and he asked us to 
remained calm and we prayed and then we left in a daze. And I'll never forget, I'll never forget, they couldn't find these girls. And my friend's father had given her a ring that morning. And all of a sudden, across Black Birmingham, we heard they had found a hand with a ring. And we knew then they had been blown to pieces. Why would I tell you such a gory story? Because lest we forget, we're doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. For years, those of us, even from our little middle class neighborhood where, where my neighbors were Cundy Rice and Angela Davis, for years we dreamed and had nightmares about those girls. And at the funeral at my church, Dr. King said, with three of the four girls, I can never forget the three coffins, and he said, life can be as hard as steel, and yet all we can do is our very best. Out of that experience, young people, that is not the end, came the Civil Rights Act, the Voter Rights Act, the Higher Education Act, and America was different. But here is what I want you at Valparaiso to know. For the first time at that funeral, in my middle class black church, I saw white faces. They were the faces of people of faith, men of faith mainly. And they came from the different churches. It turns out the two groups that had anybody white in my community, because you never even saw people who were white, were Catholic and a Lutheran church. And they were there at that funeral. They came from all over the country, but right there in my community. That Lutheran minister, the Catholic priest, the nuns. And for the first time, I saw white adults crying for black children. And then I understood what Dr. King meant when he said, we must be judged by the content of our character not by the color of our skin. And those experiences led America to say we are better, better than this. We are not going to be a place that bombs churches. That was in the 60s. We have the challenges today of people with that same kind of racism doing that. And we must stand up and say again, we are better than this that we are so much better than this, that Higher Education Act changed America, the Civil Rights Act changed America. I could become the president of a predominantly white university when as a child, I couldn't even sit in class with white children. I was told I could never be as smart as a white kid. The society told me I was second class. That was America just 50 years ago. And here we are today, if you can get an education, all kinds of things are possible. And now, think about it. In the 60s, only 10% of Americans had a college education. Only 10%. People say, when well, I say, well, how many, what percent of whites, what percent of blacks? Okay, well, what do you think? What percent of whites, students, what do you think? What percent of whites had a college education in the 60s? What would you say? Anybody, guess. Guess? 98, uh, it was 11%. Only 11% of whites, only 2 to 3% of blacks. We were not counting other groups. Now we've got a range of groups. What's the fastest growing group in our country? Hispanic, right? All right, let's look at those groups. For whites, it's 37%. For blacks, it's about 19%. For, for the fastest growing group, it's not quite 15%. For Asian Americans, it's almost 55%. For Native Americans, it's well below Hispanics. What am I saying? You put it all together, two-thirds of Americans still don't have a college degree. Most families in America, and here's the worst part of all, if you're from a low-income family of any race, as was the case in the 60s, the probability of your finishing a four-year degree is still under 10%. And there is the challenge in our country of inequality. If you are blessed to be here at Valparaiso, you're destined to be a leader in our society. And as my parents said, of those to whom much is given, much is required. 
And so I want you to know this distinction to understand the inequality that now, yes, we still have some prejudice, we have some racism, but the fact is that if one gets an education of any race, life is so much better. And yet millions of children are not learning to read. And without the reading skills, what can one do? And so here's what my message I want you to do, students. I want you to learn to ask good questions. It was I.I. Ravi who said, growing up in New York, as a, he became a Nobel laureate, he said, when I was growing up in New York, all of my friends' mothers would ask them at the end of a school day, what'd you learn in school? He said, not my Jewish mother. He said, my Jewish mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? I want you to learn to ask good questions. There's nothing like curiosity. And then I want you to learn to listen because in our society, we criticize Congress, but I tell college presidents, Mark, congressmen and women are our graduates. They came out of our colleges, and so if they can't listen, we didn't do our job. It is now that you are learning how to listen to other perspectives to learn to ask good questions, then to listen and put yourselves in the shoes of other people to understand what they're going to. And then third, to act, to learn to act. On my campus, we go to work in Baltimore City. My campus is outside of the city, very like this, very suburban, hundreds of acres. But you go into the city, and depending on where you go, you can be with children who cannot read. And we supervise little first-time offenders, little children between 8 and 15. And let me tell you, when they come to our campus, it's a different world. Just as if you go into Gary and those children come to this campus, it would be a totally different world. And so I know you're involved in civic engagement. You must come to see the light in every child and to think about what you want to do to make a difference in that child's life. You know, I want you to think about, finally, continuing to learn and to struggle when I was talking with Jim, your pastor, about the, the humility that must go as we become more enlightened. You know, it was Samuel Beckett, an Irish novelist who often wrote in French, and he wrote a book in which the character studies the dancing of bees. When bees are dancing, they're actually communicating. And he said this, here is something I could study all my life and never understand. And the significance was that he said it with great rapture. He was fascinated because the more he studied the dancing of the bees, the more he realized there was so much more to understand. And that is the essence of education itself. That when you really become educated, you know you've got so much more to do. My wife and I are now studying French. And when we had French in high school, it was for a test. So you really don't learn much. But now we're learning it because we want to communicate and quite frankly, because it is romantic. <laughs> and I work with some African nations that speak French. And so you'll appreciate this. So we, I've been reading uh, Apollinaire, the port, French port Apollinaire. So uh, Jacqueline, ma femme Jacqueline et moi, nous étudions le français maintenant, tous les jours. And nous avons passé du temps à Paris en août pour notre anniversaire. Uh, for Caron Sink for our 45th wedding anniversary. Give us a big hand for that, 45th wedding anniversary. And, and the, the line from the poem that I really want you to hear says this, la joie venait toujours après la peine. La joie venait toujours après la peine. The joy comes after the struggle. My students say, Doc, that just means no pain, no gain, right? But there is the point that life is about a struggle, that when you talk about facing the challenge of change, change is never hard. You know, I close with the story about a student who was actually fluent in Russian, an inner city kid, fluent in Russian. And I said, Tavon, what do your parents do? Because, you know, if you're fluent in Russian and you're not from Russian culture, my God, you must come from advantage. He said, Doc, I never wanted to tell you this. He said, but, I am a ward of the state. And I thought, oh my God. He said, my father was hooked on drugs by the time I was 10 or 11, and my mother left me to fend for myself by the time I was 13. I had nobody. I was actually in a crack house. He said, I didn't expect to be alive, and somehow a social worker got me out 
got me out of that house, got me into foster care, and I went from place to place. And finally, I was in Baltimore County, living in a place, and a teacher said to me, if you want to get out of this poverty, you must do well in school because education transforms lives. And he studied hard and he was able to make it to my university. He couldn't live on campus, but he said sometimes he would sleep in the library. He would hide and sleep in the library. And then he really, really made me feel so bad. He said sometimes I didn't have food and I would figure out how to get the clean part off of somebody's tray. And then it was time for his commencement. I said, who, who can come and be with you, Tavon? He said, I have nobody. And at commencement, thousands of people, all of a sudden, my, it was as if my deceased mother was telling me, get up and say something about this boy. And I got up and I said, everyone in here has family to give them support, but one of our own is here by himself, and I want him to know how much we care. And when I called his name, all of my seniors, all of my graduates were shocked because Tavon had been the one to whom they had gone when they had problems. He never told them his story. He would elevate other people. And when I said he's here alone, all of a sudden the applause began and before we knew it, a standing ovation for Tavon, not a dry eye in the place. And he said to me, Doc, I've never known love. He went on with the Fulbright, back to Russia, then to Princeton, got a grad degree, now works for the State Department, helping poor children around the world. And what is my message to you today? If Tavon can do all of that without even having parents, every one of you in here has somebody in your family who gives you love. And then you've got these wonderful faculty members here and staff members here, and you're at a fine, the finest of Lutheran institutions in the country. You are blessed to be preparing to lead. I challenge you to prepare to lead with humility. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. I tell my students your character has everything to do with who you are when you don't think your mother can see you. So thoughts become words. Words become actions, actions become habits, habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny, dreams, and values. God bless you all. Thank you all. Very